What is up? I'm Marcel and welcome back to The Modern Filmmaker. In this video, we're kind of going back to the basics and taking a look at how to set up project settings in DaVinci Resolve 17. So as much as I would love to talk about Blackmagic's new 12K camera, uh, I'm even more excited about DaVinci Resolve 17 because it's a game changer no matter what camera you're shooting on. And while I have a lot planned to show you guys, I wanted to start with some of the basics and the first one being project settings. I had to access project settings, what my personal project settings are, and also how to save project settings for fast access in the future. So let's hop into DaVinci Resolve 17 and get this started. So the first thing you're going to notice when opening DaVinci Resolve 17 is the project manager. And that's just this window here that'll have any current projects in it uh, that you've been working on uh, and where you'll access a new project. And to the left, you'll see this projects little marker here that you can click and it'll open your database. And some people ask me where they can access their database. And this is exactly where that would be. Uh, you can actually right click on local database and click on open file location to see exactly where that is in your file system. Uh, or you can come up down here to new database, click this and connect any proxy media you might have or create a whole new database uh, somewhere else. Uh, so if we close this and go into just an untitled project, we can go up to the project settings. Now, there are just two different ways to access the project settings. Once you get into the program, you can go up here to file and down to project settings, or you can come over here to the bottom of the program to the bottom right to this little uh, gear here. And you'll see that says project settings and I can click this and it'll take me to my current project settings. Now, these are the project settings that I've been using in DaVinci Resolve uh, 16, uh, just 4K UHD in 29.97 frames a second. And here at the top under presets, this is where your presets will be. And I'll actually show you how to set your own presets uh, once uh, I go through these other menu options. But here under master settings, these are your timeline formats. So exactly what format you want your timeline to be. So if you want to export at UHD, then you would set this at that resolution. If HD, then you would set that to HD. Uh, so whatever you want to export your timeline in, that is what you would generally set your timeline resolution as. Unless for some weird reason you wanted to edit in HD and export in UHD, which I don't recommend, but uh, generally what you want to export in is what you want your timeline to be in. Uh, so here you can set that resolution and you can even go down here to custom or up to custom, sorry, if you want to set something particular like an Instagram resolution or something uh, that's a different format than your typical um, movie format or video format. So if I just set this back to UHD 2160 and then come down to aspect ratio, uh, you can set aspect ratios here and then your timeline frame rate, uh, frames per second. Um, now, I've been working with 23.97 um, now that I've been working with the 12K and the 6K. Um, they just, they work better at those frame rates. And I feel like they're, they're made to work in those frame rates. So before I was working in 30 frames a second, just because uh, depending on who I was working with, it just kind of made things easier. Um, but now I'm kind of switching things around to uh, that, the standard cinema format. Um, so I'll go here to the playback frame rate and click in this to 23.976. And now we have our timeline frame rate and our playback frame rate uh, set to two different things. Now, this is just in case you have some kind of weird um, slow-mo or, or kind of effect you're doing, or maybe depending on the footage you're getting, um, maybe the footage you're getting is 60 frames a second, but you want it to play back at uh, 23 or 24 frames a second, uh, you could set that to two separate things. And if I come down here to video monitoring, I'll go down here and change this to the UHD 23.976. And this is exactly what you think it might mean. Um, this is for the monitor that you're viewing it on. So it's just asking you what resolution do you want to monitor your footage at? Uh, so if I was using maybe a, an HD screen, then it might be easier on the computer if I just go ahead and, and put the video monitoring down to HD. Uh, that way my, my computer's not trying to preview 4K when I'm not even seeing 4K on the monitor, but I am working with a UHD monitor. So I'm going to go ahead with the UHD option. And you see down below that there are some SDI options. If I had this hooked up to a computer or uh, some kind of console, uh, that's how I'd select that. And if I come down um, more SDI options and then data levels, uh, I like to set this at full, but if you see um, any kind of your computer's lagging or for some reason your computer can't handle full, then maybe try to switch that to video uh, and that might give you a better experience. 
uh, if you have maybe a weaker computer. Um, so if we go down here to video depth, I personally like to work with 10-bit. Um, generally, I'm working with the Blackmagic 6K or now the Ursa 12K. Um, at the very least, uh, I'm going to use my GH5 when running around, and even with that, I'm going to be using 10-bit. So I like to have this set at 10-bit. If you're using an 8-bit camera, um, it, you know, please set that to 8-bit. Don't don't feel like just by setting this to 10-bit, it's going to make your 8-bit footage 10-bit. That's that's not quite how it works. If you're using 8-bit footage, you, you might as well click that down to 8-bit. That way you're not trying to get your computer to do something that you don't need, uh, a step that you don't need it to take. From there, we have optimized media, which this one's pretty important um, because in the computer or in the program, you can choose to make proxies or optimize media within DaVinci Resolve. And here in these settings is actually how you dictate what kind of file it'll turn your, your current files into when making proxies or optimized media. So if I'm making proxies personally, uh, let's say I'm using um, some heavy MP4s and my computer hates all the, the compression um, and it'd just be easier to work with optimized media or proxies, or if I'm working with 12K or 8K or red raw footage, um, or, or C raw footage, Canon raw footage, they both play back really, really rough. So um, if I'm working with that kind of footage, generally I like to do a lot of color grading. So I'll keep the original resolution and just go with the DNHR uh, HQX because just by changing it from either MP4, uh, Red Raw, or Canon Raw to a DNHR, that'll save my computer a lot of hassle in the workload. Um, and it'll work with the DNHR files a lot better. So even if it is at HQX, which would be 10-bit, um, HQ would be 8-bit, SQ would be standard quality, and then you have the lowest bandwidth, uh, or bit rate, sorry, the lowest bit rate at the DNHR LB. Um, so I'm gonna go with HQX, uh, original resolution. Now, of course, uh, depending on your computer, of course, you can go down to half resolution, and that way, if you're working in 4K, then it'll kick things down to 2K, and you know, vice versa, uh, moving forward with quarter and one eighth. Um, and then down optimized media, I'm gonna do the same thing because I, I usually just need the DNHR transfer. Um, usually, I'm not in a situation as with my machine where I, I need to, you know, have different proxies versus optimized media. Um, generally, if I'm making proxies or optimized media, I'm just trying to get smoother playback. So I'm going to do exactly what I did up here with the proxies. Again, um, you can choose whatever would work best for your computer and your workflow, depending on if you work in UHD or if you're working in uh, HD. Um, or depending on uh, if you're working on a laptop or a desktop. Because um, with a laptop, you know, I would kick this down to probably half resolution and then uh, HQ at the most. On a laptop with, you know, that was a lot weaker than my tower, I'd probably kick this down to HQ uh, or SQ, depending on how powerful a laptop is. Uh, but for my computer, I'm going to go with HQX. And I'm going to go with HQX for the render cache too. Now, this might take slightly longer than the HQ, but I, I doubt it's going to take much longer um, rendering or caching this in HQ than HQX, um, especially if I'm coming from a Blackmagic RAW or a Red RAW or something that's already a, a much higher bit rate and bit depth. Um, so moving down, uh, it says enable background caching after five seconds. And I have this set to five seconds. I'm actually going to go down to three because... Sometimes that kind of frustrates me when I'm sitting there like I make an effect and I'm kind of waiting for this transition uh, to cache. And then from here, I'm going to go to automatic, automatically cache transitions in user mode. Um, I do like that uh, because transitions are really short. So usually it doesn't take long to cache a transition. Um, but then automatically cache composites in user mode. I'm going to leave that off because usually if I'm in user mode, then I want it to be a little more um, like I get to pick what's get, what gets cached. Because sometimes if you're working on a really big project, I set it to smart mode and it just starts caching everything. And I'm trying to move forward, but it's trying to cache all this stuff that I already did. And in user mode, it's, it's much easier to just tell it to cache like either the small things or just specific things that you tell it to cache. Um, like in, in this instance, I'm going to go with transitions and then automatically cache fusion effects in user mode and then working my way down. Sorry if I'm moving through this kind of fast. I just, I don't want this video to be, you know, an hour long and there's uh, quite a few things to get to. So, um, working folders, uh, this is a big one here and it's definitely something I'm going to change now proxy generation location. Now this is asking me where, when it generates proxies, where do you want it to put them? Um, and this is a big deal. Because if I have this going to a slow drive, that's not going to work well when I'm trying to edit and it's trying to cache or 
uh, generate these proxies, or if it's trying to edit off these proxies and I have them on a slow drive, that's eh, just, that's not a good idea. So what you could do is you could have your main footage on a slower drive and then have your proxies going to your fastest drive. For me, I have um, an M.2 drive going as my C drive. And then as my D drive, I have a, an extremely fast M.2 uh, drive just hooked right into the motherboard. And it transfers, at, it can do like 2600 um, megabits write speed. So super fast, super fast write and read speeds. So for me, I like uh, my proxies to be coming from this DaVinci Resolve proxy media uh, right there off that D drive. Um, and honestly, my, my footage is usually on a separate drive. So that way, this drive is just freed up to work with the files, proxy or optimized media that I'm going to be editing with. Um, and then the other drives can be kind of churning away at, at the footage, that, that the raw footage that uh, that's just kind of sitting there waiting for me to render. So from here, I can go to cache file location. Now it's asking when you cache transitions, when you cache uh, fusion effects, uh, what do you want to put those files again? And me, I don't like anything getting cached to the C drive. It just, I feel like my C drive is doing enough already handling the system and the program. Um, so I want everything to be cached on that secondary D drive. The D drive is the fastest drive I have and it's not doing anything anyway. So um, I can go ahead and have it set to cache clips. I'll change that and then gallery stills. Now you can grab stills from the color tab um, when you're coloring and you can export those stills as various different uh, picture files. And I do this all the time. Uh, so I'm actually gonna put this again on that D drive. I personally, you know, you can do what you will. You know, I don't have any scientific data on this. I'm just saying it feels better to me to be on a separate drive. Uh, that way I kind of know that everything's getting kicked this other drive and my system drive can just do its system stuff. So I'll click on dot gallery, select folder and down to retime process. Okay, now, this, this is a, a great thing to know. I'll tell you about this. I'm probably gonna keep it just like this, but what it's asking me is uh, frame interpolation. It's asking me how do I want it to process um, and, and what kind of processing do I want it to do when I retime clips. So normally it's just gonna play clips right on through at, at 24 frames or 29 frames. But let's say I have a clip in the timeline that's um, 24 frames a second, but I actually want to slow it down, but it's in a 24 frames a second timeline. I know, big no-no, you should never slow that down. But you actually can by using optical flow. It'll blend the um, frames together in a way that looks natural. Um, of course, frame blending will also blend the frames together, but it's a little bit more of a stale blend. Uh, it's not the optical flow that, that's kind of more of an algorithm to make it look more realistic and like it was shot that way. Uh, and then you have nearest, which is just kind of a normal retiming. You'll just get kind of stuttery playback if I were to slow something down um, in that kind of frame rate. And it works the same way if I were to speed things up. If I were to speed things up, that's just going to kind of skip frames in, in nearest. Um, frame blending will skip frames, but then it'll blend the frames together in kind of a linear kind of weird blend. Um, and then optical flow could also be better um, if I'm uh, speeding things up. Now, it will give you a different effect than nearest, than just skipping the frames. So I personally like to leave things at nearest and then I can change things to optical flow as I need them. I usually never use frame blending. It's usually either nearest for me uh, because things are just normally played back or I'll go down to optical flow. Uh, but that's actually in the edit tab in the clip properties uh, later on. Um, but for me, I like to leave that there. And then for most estimation, I'm gonna go ahead and change this to enhanced better because that's something I always change. And it's not going to affect your clips um, as far as your computer uh, CPU or, or power usage when you're just playing clips back normally. So if you're not slowing clips down or speeding them up, then it's not even gonna try to do any motion estimation anyway. So, um, and if it does do any motion estimation, I want it to be the best it can be. Uh, but that's up to you and kind of your computer power once again. Um, so use that to your own discretion. Uh, and then you have motion range. I'm gonna leave that at medium. Uh, this is just asking how big of a sample do you want the frame interpolation to try to read from and choose. So um, small would almost be like light frame interpolation. Medium would be like medium interpolation and then large would be like max interpolation. So if you want the max effect from this, which will give, uh, which will take up more computer power. So again, use that at your own discretion, depending on what kind of computer you're using. Um, but I like to leave this at medium 
um, because I don't see a huge difference between medium and large and in most cases. And if I do, then I can change that later on in the edit tab when I'm working with in particular clips. So moving on to image scaling. Now the uh, resize filter, I personally like to use sharper. Um, you can come in to uh, smoother if you're noticing any kind of weird artifacting or things seem like they're not aliasing right. Um, Anti-aliasing or aliasing would be those edges you get from straight lines when things aren't scaled, scaled properly. You see this a lot in video games or in 3D uh, graphics. If they're not super high res, you might see jagged lines in a straight line. Um, and so if you happen to see that, you might want to change this to smoother. Uh, or if you know a lot about this stuff, you can come in here to custom and set your own uh, resize filter kind of settings. Uh, but I just like to leave this at sharper. And I, I've never noticed um, any kind of weirdness. Most of the time, uh, there's been a couple times, I think it was back in DaVinci Resolve 15, I saw a few things, but but lately that's just been working fine for me. Anti-alias edge, edges, anti-alias edges, can I talk? Yes, I can. Um, I'm gonna set this to on. I've been doing a lot of 3D work in Fusion lately as well in the last year. Another reason I like to leave that on um, because that's where you're gonna see a lot of aliasing in Fusion. From here, we'll take a look at camera raw and go into raw profile. Now me personally, I'm generally always working with Blackmagic cameras, um, whether the Ursas or the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. Uh, this is where you can kind of set that just to kind of already be one step ahead. You can have the prog program already knowing what kind of footage you're usually working with. Um, so I'm gonna go with Blackmagic Raw and then decode quality, full res, and camera metadata is fine with me as far as decode using camera metadata. Um, that way it'll it'll kind of come in by having it set to camera metadata it'll have it come in just as i shot it so if i shot it at iso 800 it'll come in at iso 800 with all that information already in the camera raw section when i go to color uh, and then you have some subtitle options and some fair light options and again i'll need to change this i'm running at 44 um, hertz so i'll need to change that and then from here i can go up here to presets and then i can click on save and it'll update gallery path, boom, update. And then I can right click current project settings and it save as user default config. And this way it'll save that as my default. Every time I open the program, it'll start like that every time. You can also come down here to save as and save this as let's say UHD 23.976. And now I have that UHD option uh, in case I want to come here and click around and go from one to the other. Or if I just want to set up a project uh, for later use, like if, I, if I'm always doing this one project for this one client, let me go ahead and set that up. And then if I already have this other project that I'm always doing for this other client, let me go ahead and set that up. I hope that this enlightened you guys a little bit on how the project settings work uh, in DaVinci Resolve 17. If you haven't grabbed DaVinci Resolve 17 yet, definitely go grab it. Uh, I'm loving it. I've actually finished a couple projects, so I personally uh, say that I trust it. I trust the beta right now. Um, you may want to back up your projects before any <laughs> making any big moves, uh, but I've already took the plunge and I'm not regretting it. If you guys like this video, definitely go down there and click that like button. If you didn't like the video, uh, click the like button anyway, it really helped me out. And definitely leave any comments or questions, concerns down below in the comment section. And as always guys, I'm Marcel and this has been The Modern Filmmaker. And I'll see y'all next time. Peace.